Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing my fancy booktube hat. And today I'm bringing you what will hopefully be a fairly quick uh, double video of my wrap up for the Underhyped Reads Readathon that was last week and my TBR for the Diversathon Readathon, which is this upcoming week. I woke up without much of a voice today, so we'll see how this goes. But there are only two days here between these two readathons, so I thought that this was going to be the best way to get uh, both the wrap up and the TBR done was to smoosh them into one. So the Underhyped Reads Readathon was hosted by Ramblings of an Elf Pyre. It ran from September 3rd through 9th. And the goal was to read underhyped books by whatever your definition of underhyped is. I had four books on my TBR. I ended up finishing three of them. All the books I chose have under a thousand ratings on Goodreads. The first one I expect will gain a lot more ratings once it's eventually released, and that is Bright Smoke, Cold Fire by Rosamund Hodge. I consider this underhyped though because I would have thought that as the first book in a fantasy duology by an established YA fantasy author, this would have gotten some pre-hype, and so far I haven't seen anyone talking about it on booktube. Rosamund Hodge is the author of Cruel Beauty and Crimson Bound, both of which were standalones, um, and I struggled a bit with this. I don't know what, what I really thought of it. And I think this is partially because if you had like stopped me in the middle of one of her standalones and asked me to pass some sort of judgment, I would have been like, what the heck is going on? I have no clue. Uh, and that's sort of where this book ended for me. So I think I'm, I'm going to have a hard time reviewing this first half of the duology as a book on its own. This is sort of a retelling of Romeo and Juliet um, with necromancers and the end of the world. Neither Romeo nor Juliet are major point of view protagonists in this book. They're both major secondary characters. There are multiple major religious groups uh, in conflict in this story. The backstory is basically consistent with the Romeo and Juliet plot as we know it, and then this book starts at a point that's fairly late in Shakespeare's play, and then from that starting point onward, pretty much everything gets thrown out the window. So right now, I've given this a three-star rating. I'm still thinking on it, though, and I'm going to be doing a, um, a full Goodreads review on this at a later date, and also a double review video along with another book that's also the first in the series, uh, because I have a hard time talking about books that are single books in a series on their own. The second book I read was Cursed Pirate Girl Volume 1 by Jeremy A. Bastian. This has 658 ratings on Goodreads, and it's uh, several years old. I really enjoyed this. I think it's not much of a conventional, like, comic book style graphic novel. Of course, I don't read many conventional comic style graphic novels, so I don't have that great a point of comparison. But the biggest deal about this is the artwork, and it's this really sort of intense ink work that um, is, I think, intentionally supposed to call to mind 19th century illustration, like the original illustrations from Alice in Wonderland. It does the same thing where some of the more outrageous characters have like oversized heads and so forth. And this is about a cursed pirate girl who is the daughter of a pirate captain of the mythical Omerta Seas. And she sets off on an adventure to try to go find her father to get to the Omerta Seas. She has to go through this magical portal to this you know, sort of mythical pirate seas world, and it's a lot of fun. It's not easy to read. Most pages you have to stare at them a good long while to piece together the actual like story and text and events from all of the everything that's on every page, uh, but there's a whole lot to see on every page and I think it's well worth the time. There is just an incredible amount of detail in this art. So this is volume one of what's intended to be a two-volume story. It does end on a bit of a cliffhanger. The thing about this author uh, slash artist is that he works very, very slowly uh, because the work is so incredibly detailed. I've done a bit of research. This is intended to be a three-chapter story with uh, each volume being three chapters. I think each chapter is individually published as an issue, 
but the thing is, he takes like a couple of years for each chapter. So even though volume one is several years old, um, it's probably going to be some time before we have volume two. I actually find that I'm frequently drawn to the sorts of authors who take a lot of time with their work um, and maybe aren't publishing on a regular schedule but are really meticulous with their uh, quality. So this isn't something that I particularly mind and I've enjoyed discovering a graphic novel artist who works this way. We do start off with uh, a little girl named Apollonia meeting Cursed Pirate Girl and she ends up being left behind on this big expedition and the, at the end we see her again and I I'm curious to know uh, what's going to happen with her in volume two. We also get at the end of each of these chapters these one-page interludes of Pid Fishbit and Pook Tarantula in That Which Men's All, a romance in six parts, and they are these weird little interludes that are just one page and so far not connected to the rest of the story at all, and I have no idea why they're there and what's going on, but I'm enchanted. So yeah, Cursed Pirate Girl Volume 1 was uh, interesting and delightful. And then the last thing I finished during the week was a reread of The Phoenix Dance by Dia Calhoun. This is, uh, it has 515 ratings on Goodreads. It's a retelling of The Twelve Dancing Princesses set in the same kingdom as one of her other novels, uh, Aria of the Sea, which I read quite a few times. That was a book I reread several times in high school, so I remember that one fairly well, but I think I only read this once, so I didn't remember it very well. If you're thinking of picking these books up, this one takes place several decades after Aria of the Sea, but uh, some characters from that book make appearances as secondary characters in this book, so if you don't want to be spoiled at all, then I would suggest starting with Aria of the Sea and then reading this, even though this is a perfectly good standalone. This book and a lot of her other books are sadly out of print, but you can find them used online, so if, uh, so if they interest you, I highly encourage you to do so. This is a retelling of The Twelve Dancing Princesses, and the protagonist of this book is a girl named Phoenix, who uh, at the beginning uh, gets herself apprenticed to the royal shoemaker. And sort of the big emotional crux of this book is the fact that Phoenix is a character with bipolar disorder. It goes by a different name in this world, but basically it's bipolar disorder. And in uh, the afterword, the author says that she herself has bipolar disorder and had wanted to write about it, but didn't quite know how until she had this sort of revelation that she was going to use the story of the Twelve Dancing Princesses to talk about bipolar disorder in a book for young adults. And I think I kind of missed that whole aspect of this book just a little bit when I read it when I was younger, but on this reread I could really clearly see how uh, she was trying to use this story and this fairy tale retelling to raise awareness about mental illness to an audience of younger readers, and I really appreciated that. I've read some Goodreads reviews on this because I just was flipping through Goodreads to see what other people in general thought, and some people seem to think that the uh, focus on mental health takes away from the retelling, and I don't agree with that. I sort of think that some of the best retellings are retellings where the author actually has something uh, they want to say with the story that's their own uh, thing that they feel passionate about and want to talk about, and they've found this story as the way for them to talk about that. And I think that's definitely the case with this book. Now this was published in 2005, and one of the things I think I want to emphasize pretty uh, soundly is that this does not read like young adult fiction of 2016. This reads like young adult fiction of 2005, and I think there have been significant changes in the genre since then. I think compared to most of the YA fantasy being published today, uh, some of the political intrigue uh, and uh, political discontent in this book is just downright flimsy, and the world building is kind of more whimsical than believable. So in, 
in those ways I think it reads a little bit more like today's middle grade even though the protagonist is a teenager and this is meant to be a book for teenagers. There's a minor plot thread about Phoenix's family and the Duchy of Trebiness that honestly felt a little underdeveloped and pointless. Some of the descriptive language is really beautiful. She describes this place, this city, in this kingdom as just this really gorgeous place that I'm just like, I want to be there. So overall, I was really pleased with this reread for what it is, and I gave it four stars. The last book I started for Diversathon on the last day of the readathon on Friday but didn't finish was Mortal Fire by Elizabeth Knox. This is another YA fantasy. This um, takes place in like an alternate 1959 New Zealand. And I had absolutely no idea how long this book was because I looked at this and this looks like a kind of short YA fantasy book. Um, but the pages are so, so thin, and this is actually 436 pages long. I didn't realize at all, so if I had known that, I would have known there was no chance I was going to finish this in a readathon week. But I was silly, and I didn't look at the page count before I started. The Diversathon is a fairly spontaneous readathon that has emerged in response to some nasty comments that were made in a video um, about diversity in literature. And so in support of diversity, several members of the booktube community came together to create this spontaneous readathon. The Diversathon runs from September 12th through 19th. It's hosted by Monica from She Might Be Monica, Whitney from Witty Novels, Christina from Christina Marie, and Joss from Squibbles Reads. And I was actually genuinely dismayed when this was announced, and I thought, oh, I'll just look and find what diverse books are in my TBR for the rest of the month and read those during that week, which is honestly what I frequently do with readathons. And I looked at the books that I had on my TBR for the rest of the month, and they were all, like, by straight white people, about straight white people. And I was like, oh no. So I still want to read all the books that were on my TBR for the month. Um, but in the spirit of the Diversathon, which is about diversifying our reading so that we gain a wider experience of the world and we challenge ourselves to read stories about people who are different from ourselves or by people who are different from ourselves, I decided that I was going to layer on top of my previously scheduled reading for this week some novellas and other short fiction that represent the diversity that uh, sadly was not present in my previously scheduled reads. So first I've got a couple of novellas that are published published in book form that I really want to read, and the first is Binti by Nadia Okorafor. This won both the Hugo and the Nebula for best novella. This is a sci-fi story. Nadia Okorafor's writing is based in her African heritage, and I have been itching to read this for a good long time, and because it's short, I had been thinking that I would wait for a readathon to show up to read this for a readathon, and this is just the perfect readathon to read Binti. The second novella that I have printed in book form is Six Gun Snow White by Catherine M. Valente. This is a little longer, and her writing is very dense, so this might actually take me a good long while to read. This is a Western retelling of Snow White in which the protagonist is biracial and half Native American. As far as I'm aware, the author isn't of Native American heritage, but she does write uh, very diversely. She writes things that are inspired by a whole range of different cultures, and what I've read of her so far, she seems to me to treat all of the cultures she writes about with an incredible amount of respect. So I thought this might be an opportunity to bump this a little higher on my TBR. And then I've got another thing that I want to read. I don't know technically if the length of this makes it a novella or what. I don't know what the, the length for a novella is. Um, but this I have is available for free online, and so I've printed it out because I cannot read on my computer screen, and that's The Pauper Prince and the Eucalyptus Gin by Usman Malik. Yes, this calls it a novella. I don't know because I've printed it out in web page format what the length of this is. 
compared to like the length of these. But yeah, I struggle a lot with short fiction because I can't really read very long things on my computer screen without like hurting my eyes and giving myself a headache and I don't have an e-reader. So one of the things I sometimes do for individual short stories that are free online is I just print out the web page and read it like this. The author is Pakistani and lives in the United States, and I think this is about a Pakistani-American character, and I think there's going to be fantasy and folklore and so forth in it, which is very much my thing. I've actually heard very good things about this. Um, on various booktube channels of people who've read it, so I'm looking forward to reading this. And then I may just browse around online for uh, some other short fiction of the much shorter variety, depending on how much time I have, who knows? So that's my sort of loose TBR for the Diversathon, as well as my wrap-up for the Underhyped Reads readathon. I have lost my light while I've been filming, but I have not lost my voice yet, so that's one good thing. Anyhow, let me know if you've read any of these books, if you're planning on reading any of these books. Let me know if you participated in the Underhyped Reads readathon, or if you're participating in the Diversathon coming up. That is all. Bye for now.